I believe there's a reason that I was asked to be last, and that is to pacify uh, <laughs> <laughs> you guys forget, and for there not to be a Tupac Biggie showdown at the end. Uh, now, <laughs> there's a problem that I want to talk about. It's a little bit more specific than, than what uh, Kurt and John have been arguing. The problem, to me, phenomenologically is, why do I agree with both of them? <laughs> and I think that the answer is that they're both right, but they're both missing, they're talking over each other about the concept of harm and the concept of fury. And in fact, I, I was hard pressed to find where the actual disagreement was. So. Um, some of what I have to say has already been said very nicely, um, but I'm going to say it again. Um, um, there was a really important move that was made in moral psychology by people like Rick Schwader, Paul Rosen, John Hyatt, C. Graham. And that move was to get beyond the notions of ethics in the Western philosophical tradition that were just based on justice and harm. And what that required was actually taking a look at the diversity of moral judgment across cultures. So one of my favorite papers of all time, and one of the reasons I even decided to study moral psychology was Schrader, Nahapur, and Miller when uh, they actually went to India. I recommend anybody, if, if you're interested in moral psychology and haven't read this paper, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. It's unfortunately not the kind of research that gets done very often, um, but it was actually going and asking real people uh, the things that they believed. And what you see when you take you zoom out and look at global morality is that it really is different than our narrow conception. At least at the descriptive level, you might say normatively it still is about justice and harm, but as psychologists, at the descriptive level, this added a richer understanding of what human morality is. It, it's not just about harm. I just love the, I like to think that some teeth are actually flying out. Um, obviously, there's a lot that is about, I think mean, there's no disagreement here, a lot of it is about harm, um, but it has to be about more than harm if we were to explain some of the odd things that people believe in the moral domain. One way of asking this question is simply asking, look, the broadest question, I think one of the most interesting questions, is can just anything be moralized? If you had, just, we just gave you a little kid, a little baby. Everybody got a baby. Everybody gets a baby. <laughs> look under your seat. Um, <laughs> let's say that you want to teach it that something is morally wrong. Can you teach it anything? Can, is, is the nature of moral psychology that it is completely unconstrained? All it requires is for you to insist that it is immoral? Or is it constrained? This was, I think, I think is this, the biggest strength of, the, of moral foundations theory. Because what it said is, look, there is a lot of diversity, but it's constrained. It's constrained by a set of psychological mechanisms that are going to give rise to a set of universal commonalities in moral judgment. So, in fact, Schwader, and, and maybe John, uh, and Kurt can stop talking now. Um, uh, Schwader actually bordered on saying, in fact, probably anything can be moralized. He was much more on, on the relativistic side um, but since then, moral foundations theory, I think, has done a nice job of actually integrating a view of the mind that believes in some universals with uh, a desire to, to explain the diversity. So, there's harm and fairness and justice, and there's authority and loyalty. But what I want to talk about is the concept of purity. And I think that this is the worst concept in the world. Um, first of all, I don't even know what to call it. It's titled Purity in our thing, but I think it's Sanctity now. Um, and it used to be Divinity. 
And I think uh, Kurt already uh, really did a nice job of describing how different, how many different things get lumped into this category. But what I want to argue is that both John and Kurt um, really are acting as if this is an empirical question when they're doing conceptual work. A whole lot of conceptual assumptions that are going into the category of what what purity is. And they're accepting those. And I think that there needs to be a lot, we need to clean up the concept of purity. And I think that there's no good reason to believe that any of these things should be tossed together. Maybe some of them. But I mean, let's look. Uh, this is, Kurt already did this, but brothers and sisters, incest and sexual promiscuity, weird sexual acts with no apparently direct harm. Uh, apparently it's for you, uh, You know, they, but by the way, I am guilty of this. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not the gender <laughs> <laughs> It's a conceptual work. <laughs> Um, <laughs> purposefully wearing unmatched clothing, consuming drugs, alcohol, tobacco, meat, or unclean foods, smearing cappies, and dying arm, drinking spoiled milk. Uh, this is from a study we did, giving a homeless person your sandwich because you know it's the bread is moldy. A uh, widow wearing jewelry too soon after her husband's death. It's from, from the Indian sample. So, the first step really is, okay, what's the, how are these things alike? Um, so, all of these things have been asked and labeled purity, and then those findings are used to bolster one account or another. See, so no, these are all about harm, and these are all actually um, maybe about disgust, or these are all about divine, uh, divine command theories, something like that. Um, but the data is dirty. We're starting dirty, and we're using the evidence with a uh, sloppy concept as evidence to support one theory over another. Um, and when you look at the MFQ, which again has been used as a measure of purity, the items of purity are, do you think, for instance, it's important to, the mor to morality whether or not someone violated purity? Uh, whether or not someone did something disgusting? Whether or not someone acted in a way that God would approve of? So these are combined into an index of purity, but again, it's an assumption. Right? It is an a priori assumption going into the construction of the scale that these are going to be the same. So that when you combine them, and then you correlate your score on the MFQ with individual acts that violate purity, it's of course going to be correlated with things that God says is wrong, things that are disgusting, um, and things that I just call impure because of a metaphor. Um, and in the acts that are used, I would call some acts wrong on the grounds that they're unnatural, Chastity is important and valuable virtue. People should not do things that are disgusting or no one's harm. This is a broad category, and I'm not convinced that this is the right way to split up moral foundations. I'm much more convinced than the other moral foundations than that this one is any sort of a natural kind, let alone uh, a, a kind that we should be using. Um, so, when you look across the literature when, at the way in, pe in which people describe, again, including us, um, sometimes purity is defined as wrong but harmless. Sometimes it's defined as a wrong thing that gives rise to a disgust response. Sometimes it's it's talked about as disgusting things that cause us to believe that something is wrong. Sometimes it's, it's talk of pollution, um, either direct pollution by ingesting things that are bad for you, or more metaphorical pollution, sex, food, cleanliness, um, or again, it's things that defile the soul. Now, already there's a problem here because murder defiles the soul. Um, there's another problem that acts that God says are wrong are usually also pretty messed up. They're pretty harmful. So these are not clean ways to be getting at what we think of as a distinct, what, what we're trying to defend as a distinct domain. Um, so, so what's the problem? The broadest definition of purity that actually does and, ca and capture all of these things is so broad as to be pretty meaningless. That is, it's, it's almost tautological. That is, things that are impure are things that are impure. Um, but really, it becomes just a bucket of leftovers. And that's the way that when I look at across the scenarios, in the way that Kurt has more recently systematically looked across scenarios, all you're left with is, is a feeling that these were the, these were the scraps. 
right? We, everything fit into one bucket. Now, oh, what about those things that they, people say, like, don't eat shrimp because God said so, and you should meditate and be vegetarian, but not because it's harmful, because you're defiling your ancestors or something like that, right? It, it, it's, it's, a le it's a leftover bucket. But when you look at the more narrow concept, like the more narrow definitions of what purity ought to involve, they certainly don't capture everything we've been talking about. And in fact, uh, they, they seem extremely limited. That is, we, the way in which we talk about purity is not, uh, is not really captured by theories that, that Ty, as Kurt also said. Uh, lots of disgusting things aren't wrong. Lots of wrong things aren't disgusting. Um, many purity violations are actually harmful, right? But we call them purity because of some other criteria, like God said so. Many divine commands are commanded because of their presumed harm. So, I think what needs to happen is we need to unpack this concept, and the really important thing to do is tie it more closely to psychological mechanisms that we know are at work. So, unpacking the concept of purity in the same way that John started out doing great conceptual work by looking at the literature and deciding that there were five, maybe six moral foundations, we need to go into the concept of purity and do a little more unpacking. So, there are a lot of possibilities when you look at it this way. It could be that there is a separate psychological mechanism that, for instance, Joel and Bar and I and others have argued, that is just about disease avoidance. And that this is accounting for prohibitions that have to do with uh, uh, food, sex, cleanliness, and maybe even uh, xenophobic uh, intuitions, moral intuitions. Right? That could be one mechanism tied to a psychology that we have a lot of data about, disease avoidance. Um, and that may not be the same explanation, right? To take, uh, to take John's point even further, there is no reason to believe that the same psychological mechanism is at work in all these purity judgments, right? Don't use, what was it, Occam's chainsaw on yourself. Um, so metaphorical accounts of tiger against and cleanliness um, may, may be used to bolster, bolster cultural norms, for instance, right? Things that are fairly arbitrary, but the metaphors are still powerful, even though they might not directly recruit disgust. In fact, the one time I was able to talk to Rick Schrader about this, he said, the whole time when he was in India, all of these things that were violations of divinity, he never, he never saw anybody really get disgusted about. He said, I, I don't know, I never said that, right? He says, it, it wasn't really, I, I never saw one of the people in our sample get disgusted over these purity violations. Um, so, we could also try to get a better understanding of supernatural concepts and the rich work right now on the basic mechanisms underlying belief in the supernatural and how those might be used to bolster, perhaps through the use of harm. Um, my favorite example comes from my own upbringing as a religious person. My mom literally told me that the angels would cry if I didn't clean my room. <laughs> so, that's harm. I'm hard, like I'm making an angel sad. <laughs> it's a lot of therapy. <laughs> um, it's a little dream about the um, And there's another, what we've argued and what nicely others, but Hannah Chapman, Alec Chakroff, and Wayne Young have been arguing that there is this mechanism of character evaluation, right? And that may be a separate mechanism. That is, you really, really care about what somebody is like. And when they do really weird shit, sorry. Um, they're just probably going to do bad stuff later. Um, so, so there could be a variety of psychological mechanisms that offer better singular, singular explanations of the mechanisms that are going on for this variety of, of the things that we call period. So if we ask the question, well, is it actually harm, right, what, it, what seems to be at the heart of the debate, I think both Kurt and John probably know, in the, their deepest of deep hearts, that it's not the interesting question. In fact, they've said this themselves. It really is, you can unpack this question to be much more interesting. So there probably are different psychological mechanisms that are acting when people have a clear, direct harm imagined. So if I really can't imagine somebody punching somebody else, 
um, there is going to be a strong empathy or sorry, well, har harm avoidance uh, uh, mechanism that kicks in. And perhaps those kinds of moral injunctions are the ones that are going to be really, really easy to inculcate in children because it's, very, it's a very strong mechanism when you can imagine a salient victim. But second or third order harms that require belief in abstract entities, some sort of cultural belief, like the belief in, in gods or dead ancestors, um, or in society, um, those are going to be a little bit more difficult to inculcate, maybe less likely to be universal, more reliant on cultural knowledge, and they will seem weirder to people outside of the culture, right? It's not to say that they don't tie back to harm, but it's simply to say that when you're talking about harming abstract entities, maybe there's different mechanisms involved than when you're talking about harming an individual. Um, and these may require, again, learning deeply about a cultural norm um, and having lo local knowledge. All right, concluded. in conclusion, uh, I think that what, what's become clear in this literature is that we need better operatory conceptual work before we even start collecting data. Because if we're collecting data and just calling it all purity and then saying we found that purity is related to this or purity is related to that, uh, we're not really saying much because we don't have a clear idea of what purity is in the first place. So to unpack the concept, you know, I think you do some better conceptual work will be you know, better psychology. Thank you.